Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today's episode discusses product development, which reminded me of a process I learned in grad school called StageGate. Now, first, let me start out by saying StageGate is a trademark idea, so please do not go and start a process and call it StageGate unless you've been given proper approval. In fact, I'm simply going to highlight what can be easily found online just to save myself here. In short, StageGate is a model to identify new business opportunities and to generate new product, service, or technology ideas. So if you are a developer and you are thinking of an idea, this process may be for you. StageGate has six stages, or gates as they know them. The first gate is discovery. You have created an idea. Now what do you do with that? You move on to the next gate. Gate one, you investigate that idea. Google, read. This is called secondary research, research that is done by someone else. Once you have done your secondary research, you move on to the next gate. Gate two, primary research, surveys, focus groups, interviews, observations. Unlike secondary research, this research is done by you. The next stage, stage three, is the development stage. Develop operations or procedures required to eventually full-scale production. What do you need to do to take this product or idea to market? The next stage, stage four, test and validate. Beta, testing, prototypes, get out there, ask consumers, get products in their hand or the idea. And then the last stage is to launch the idea. If you are a developer or you're creating a new idea, this may be a process for you or something similar. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, Relax and enjoy the show. My next guest comes from a long line of shoemakers dating back to 1932 when her grandfather, William Danner, started Danner Boots. She is a wife, a mother of two, and a certified pedorthist. Please welcome the vice president of Crary Shoes, Meredith Crary Johnson. All right. Good evening, Meredith. Thank you so much, uh, the vice president from Crary Shoes. I am very excited to interview today. Thank you so much for joining me on the Shades of Entrepreneurship very unique industry that you work in, uh, one that actually, you know, actually helps one of my uh, family members. So would love to introduce the world to Meredith and give, give the world a little bit of background. Who is Meredith? Gosh, well, <laughs> um, I grew up in a household with four brothers raised in an entirely a shoe family. My grandfather is Bill Danner of Danner Boots and my father started Crary Shoes in 1978. Um, I have multiple family members who are also in footwear. So it wasn't my intention necessarily to get into this industry. Sort of happened organically. Um, I went to college to get my business degree. I had a lot of intentions on working for big corporate mm. and never intended to necessarily be an entrepreneur or um, work, you know, work for myself, work for the family business. Yeah. I kind of thought that the business was too small for me. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, um, actually the last, my junior year, s summer after my junior year of college, um, uh, my father and I, and one of my older brothers met with a local podiatrist. He's still a podiatrist today. He's a, um, professor, uh, mentor in this, um, in this area. And he sat down with us and said, look, diabetes is in an, a huge growing field and you guys are, are really sort of perfect. You've built this foundation for being a diabetic shoe provider. But when it came down to looking what it took to get into that, um, 
I could see my dad's eyes <laughs> sort of coming out of his head. And, um, it, you know, when you're working with Medicare mm, yeah. and insurance, it's a whole new game, yep. major game changer. So I thought, well, my parents have been amazing. They've given me everything I could possibly need as far as support and getting me, helping me through college. So I'll give it six months. I will put a business plan together. Um, I know how to do that. I'm a business major, a marketing major. Um, and then I'll intern over the summer, earn a little bit of money, and we'll see where this goes. So my intention was definitely about six months is what I, I had in my brain. And um, we put the plan together and my dad's like, there's no way I am going to deal with this. I'm a shoemaker <laughs> through and through. I'm a people person. I am not a paperwork guy. I'm, I'm not a red tape guy. That's not me. So the deeper I got in, um, I actually went back to school and became a podorthist. Mm. Anytime I'm at a conference, I speak to podiatrists, vascular surgeons, nurses, and I say, do you know what a podorthist is? Yeah, I was about to ask, what is a Oh my goodness. <laughs> you get like hardly anybody that raises their hand that knows what that is. Yeah. Podiatrist? What? <laughs> yeah. Prostatist? So um, a podorthist is actually, uh, the way I say it to my patients is I'm a pharmacist for your podiatrist, your orthopedic surgeon. They're writing prescriptions, they're diagnosing, and they're sending you to me to handle, to fill the prescription of footwear, orthotics, braces, and they entrust you, trust me, to, to help the patient um, with whatever they need for their particular ailment. Um, it, in our world, unfortunately, the prescriptions aren't very specific. Um, they send them to us. Hey, my patient has diabetes with a wound, mm. you know, please take care of them. Maybe even make recommendations for what they need. Uh, so really, we're helping them with biomechanics, um, looking at whatever their ailment might be. We've had to study rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, um, congenital foot deformities. And our goal is to get them if they're post-surgery, they're not healthy enough for surgery, um, could be lots of different things. Maybe they can't have surgery because they need to stay working. Um, our job is to assess that and then figure out what's the best solution for whether it's footwear, orthotics, braces, or a combination of the three to get them back to living the life that they want to live. Gotcha. So, so for the folks at home, give them a quick synopsis. What is Crary Shoes? So Crary Shoes um, started out as a custom shoe, ma- shoe provider, custom shoemaker. My dad wanted to work directly with the public. And so um, started out cowboy boots, anything that walked in the door, you name it. Um, 2005, we now became an orthopedic shoe provider. Okay. More specifically, um, you know, 1979, the first orthopedic patient walked in the door, lost his toes to electricity on a work injury. And, you know, and there was some of that along the way. But when we brought in um, working with insurance and and going after the, the diabetic footwear market, we truly are an orthopedic shoe provider. Um, so we offer anything from over-the-counter shoes with custom orthotics, shoe modifications, lifts, and um, completely custom shoes from scratch as well as custom ankle braces. Wow. So so you mentioned you uh, before you're getting into this endeavor, you gave them six months. What was, what was that catalyst that kind of said, you know what, this is it. I kind of want to do this. I love two things. I love to solve problems. Okay. And... I love making things. I think it was growing up in the shoe company. You know, I'd go in, I'd sew linings. You know, you have tools at your disposal and kids will create. Oh yeah. Yeah. So being able to see a problem, come up with a solution, make a product, see it on someone and it works that that stuck with me. And also there's 
so few women in this industry. Yes. That was another big thing for me. I got into, once I got into the school or the class for pedorthics, because you have to take um, the class and it's pretty short but intense, and then a, um, a thousand hands-on hours um, and then take an exam. Um, I was, I don't know, one of two women maybe um, in my in my class. Oh, wow. And definitely the youngest, but but it's just a, ma- a male-led industry for whatever reason. I don't know if women are a little pansy about touching <laughs> feet. Um, people often ask me, why on earth did you get into this? Yeah. Um, male patients more specifically will ask me that. Um, I don't know if they just get caught off guard when they expect a middle-aged man <laughs> to be working with them. Um, and so I'll, you know, kind of give them the brief synopsis of the story and how I got into it. But ultimately my, my answer is always similar as far as I love to solve problems. I love being active and it's kind of heartbreaking when you can't see people be as active and live the life that they want to. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, you, you mentioned, you know, you like to solve problems. Where did that come from? Oh gosh, that's a great question. Um, I don't know. I'm just, I'm kind of tenacious and I'm passionate. Um, and I saw this huge, this huge problem of of really diabetes is, is the biggest piece of that, Mm -hmm. um, of these people. And I, and I, my mother instilled, she's a physical therapist, um, for 48 years. She was, she's now retired and, you know, we were instilled with active lifestyle, nutrition, and I just, I have, I'm kind of a fixer, um, whether that's through people having issues, um, with their physical or their mental, um, health. Um, I want to, I want to fix. And so the problem solving, I guess, just, I don't know, kind of came naturally just even through sports growing up. I, I wanted to be a fixer, whatever that meant. You know, that's, that's kind of like the core of entrepreneurship, right? Is you, you set out to fix a problem. So what, what problem did you identify, right? When you started to do Crary Shoes and you, you said, you know what? I noticed there's a problem actually that six months I'm going to stay. What was it like? Was there a problem that you noticed? Like, you know what? This is, I want to stay for this to solve this issue. Um, yeah. So the pedorthic industry as a whole, mm-hmm. somebody might, if they were listening, might not want me to say this, but it's super stagnant. Okay. Um, and when I think of, I feel like I have quite a few entrepreneurs in my family and friends as well. And when I look at something of, if I'm going to be in an industry, I want to figure out, can I A, solve a problem that hasn't been solved and B, can I be the best at it? Nice. Um, and so I looked at diabetic shoes. They were ugly. Nobody wanted to wear them. I know you understand this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so we've had these conversations, but um it was just super stagnant. And, and I, if people are going to get something and then they're going to throw it in their closet, you didn't solve a problem. Mm -hmm. You might've solved it functionally, but if they're not willing to actually wear it, you still didn't solve the problem. Yeah. And, and shoes in this industry and it's, unfortunately it's a lot because of money. Mm -hmm. They don't, insurance doesn't pay a lot for shoes. And so therefore it's the low, it's just the low on the totem pole, you know, prosthetics, braces, they get a lot of, they just, yeah, that's true. They're glitzy and, um, you can charge a lot for them. And so that's what people want. And then the shoes just become an afterthought. Mm. So then I saw that as like an even bigger problem of, okay, how can I serve these people? And still make money yeah. because I'm still an entrepreneur yeah. and I'm hardworking, but I want to show something for that right yeah. at the end of the day, I got to yeah. provide. So, um, our, my goal and still is to this day is how to work within the parameters of Medicare and whatever the insurance is, give people the same quality that I would want for myself and how to make that more efficient. So I'm solving a problem for the patient, but I'm solving a problem for myself of, how do I make something still as good, but then make more money on it right, by being right. more efficient with what I'm doing? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. You know, 
as being an entrepreneur, it sometimes is scary, right? You're kind of taking, you have to have a lot of risk tolerance. Did you ever feel there was a moment of, of self doubt that you're like, man, maybe I should have stayed in the corporate world. Or do you feel pretty comfortable? Like, Hey, I got this. Um, there's definitely been times because I'm competitive individual. I got this through a being one, you know, the one girl of <laughs> a house of, of four brothers, um, and B sports a hundred percent. I've played almost every sport and I love it and it just makes you competitive. So the thought of, gosh, I've never really had to have a real job interview. Mm. Could I go out into the industry and would I be hireable? Would, would I be competitive in a corporate world? And it's still always something that I've thought about. Mm -hmm. Um, because you just never know what happens in this world. And when COVID hit, what's going to happen with our business? And, you know, it became a new problem to solve. Um, but I thought, you know, I'm, I'm grounded and I knew that we would come out, you know, on top, but it's still always in the back of your mind. Are you, could I make it in the corporate world? Yeah. That was always, you know, something just because I didn't, I didn't have to technically get hired. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. Do, do you feel that, there was any self-doubt in the business at any point. Like you mentioned COVID. And I think that's one of the things I've, I've talked with a lot of entrepreneurs and they kind of felt like during that time in particular, there was like, Oh, maybe we might have to close down. You know, did you, did you ever feel that at any point in time or, um, or with the, you know, the insurance piece, are you guys pretty good? Yeah. So fortunately, I mean, there was, we took a big hit. I mean, patients weren't seeing to their doctors, Therefore, they weren't getting prescriptions. It's a domino effect. And that that happened in so many industries. I don't want to complain because we're so much better off than a lot of the other Mm. industries. Um, And so we we did come out of it. And and I knew at the end of the day, the worst case scenario in my mind was having to have an employee or several employees stay home um, because we weren't busy enough. And then I always think, you know, our, our business is small. There's about 10 of us Mm. and we treat everybody like family. And so for me, I'm thinking, well, they need to provide for their families too. Yeah. So, you know, we, we definitely, um, got the, the, um, PPP and that made that kind of helped us make our way through the tough time. And now we're kind of back on our way up to like, not quite to normal, but we're, we're getting there. That's good. Yeah. And I think that, you know, a lot of people kind of struggled in that piece, right? Trying to kind of figure out exactly where, where they're going to kind of make their next move. Now let's kind of go through the process of creating a shoe. I would love to kind of hear how is, how does this process go? Do you guys use 3D printers? Is it hand done or how, how does, how do you guys make the shoe? Gosh, yeah, it's changed so much since I even started like 17 years ago. Um, which is amazing because if we still have to do it the old school way, (laughs) I don't know if I would be as interested now. Um, I like that things are progressing. Yeah. I hate when things get stagnant. Yeah. So, um, and, and, and technology is good when it works. <laughs> um, there have been points in, in the pedorthic world where they've tried to use technology and I've tested it, um, personally to scan someone's foot and then they're making diabetic orthotics off of a scan. And these orthotics, it's not that the 3d technology isn't there, it's that these orthotics for whatever reason are coming out and the doctors say they all look the same. Oh, interesting. They don't look like the patient's foot. They all look the same. And so we tested it out because the industry was saying to me, look, you can't afford to make these orthotics by hand. You have to use our process. You have to use scans and have us mill these out on a machine and everything's computerized. So we tested it because I'd be kind of dumb if I didn't at least right. yeah. test it. So we did. And I, I hated it. They used our company actually as a barometer of if we can please Meredith at Crary <laughs> shoes, cause she has a high standard, then, then we're golden. And unfortunately I gave it like six months and I was like, I don't like your product. Wow. And for me, you know, my goal is, is definitely bigger than just the city of Portland. Mm-hmm. But I listen to, you know, the patients are my client, but so are their doctors. Mm. And I have to, like, I always say, if we make something a doctor can't take it out and look at it and be impressed, yeah, we didn't do a good job. So 
those doctors were giving me the feedback of, look, Crary's the only company in our area that's still making these by hand and we love their product. So why would I go away from that? Um, and we're very fortunate. Most of a lot of our competition doesn't have an entire factory mm-hmm. at their disposal. So why would I not use that? Yeah. If I'm going to be in an industry, why would I want to be like everybody else? I want to, I want to set myself apart. Yeah. So back to what you asked me in terms of the process, um, evaluate, you know, every patient that comes in, everybody's different, you know, use similar tools maybe, but we can use them in different ways to help each person individually. So I don't treat anybody like the next person in terms of, you know, a lot of places you can go and everybody gets the same orthotic or everybody gets the same thing. Anybody that comes in where each person is treated as an individual with whatever their job might be or position in life um, is fits to transfer out of a wheelchair to go to the bathroom safely. Mm -hmm. If it's to stay at work and provide for their family, we care about that. And so that's kind of first and foremost in our process. Um, If we're going to make a custom, a truly custom molded shoe, because that's kind of the, I guess the most unique part about what we do um, as opposed to what anybody else does is we take a cast of their foot. We still aren't there. Like technology is close, but it's not quite there in terms of just scanning the foot Okay. because of the position that we want them in. Gotcha. That's really, really key to what we do. My dad has a, a cheesy but incredibly true saying called the last is always first. So in our world, when we're making a custom shoe, the last is the mold mm. that we make the shoe on. Gotcha. Like Nike has their last, Adidas has their last, all these companies. Um, and the last is what determines the width at the toe box, right. the, the toe, you know, the height at the toe box, the heel height. Mm-hmm. It determines what the what it's going to look like, but also more importantly in my world, what it's going to fit like. And so that's why the last is always first. You gotcha. could have a, you could you could have. There's a lot of people that um, have a desire to make things, and so they want to learn how to make shoes more as a hobby. And they could make a beautiful shoe, but if it doesn't fit or solve that problem, yeah. it, it's just what, something you can put your plants in, um, which I've seen, you know, in times past. So the last is always first. Once we get that right, what's really cool is once we take that cast, which is still an old school way of doing it, but it's tried and true. Then we take that last, that cast and we scan it in a 3d scanner. Gotcha. So we do have a state of the art 3d scanner and that keeps the shape that we want, scans it, brings it into a 3d CAD cam program we actually brought a team in flew them in from England and paid for them to teach us in a week of cry. I'm all about crash course learning. Yeah. yeah. Um, so learned how to make last digitally. And um, we then take that, that image, that file, and we have a CNC carving machine where we carve these molds out. Well, in fact, this past year, and part of it might have been to COVID, but just more and more companies are moving their their processes to China or Mm. wherever. Well, our last our last company that we would get these blocks from, they moved everything to China. Mm. So we thought, well, we're not going to ship these from China. We're you know bringing them in so many months, and it's just it's kind of ridiculous. So we thought, okay, new problem to solve. So then we tried Mexico because there's nobody in the United States that we can get them from. Um, The shipping and the time, the shipping costs more than the product. Mm. That's painful. That is rough. Right. And so, okay, next, um, I kept saying to my dad, I just knew that 3D printing we've talked about for like a decade, but in the past, they're too expensive, too slow. How do we keep up with our capacity? So, um, I said, well, now's our time. We got to push and we got to look at this. So, um, we'd been talking, my, my brother, another one of my brothers is in shoemaking as well. Um, more in the development area of mass producing. 
Um, and my nephew works for him and he's into the 3D and Rhino technology mm. um, software. And he said, you know, 3D printers really have come a long way. Let's take a look at them. Um, and then just it's funny how things kind of happen all at once. This other company that's trying to manufacture or is manufacturing some cus- uh, sandals mm. locally, not custom, but um, they reached out to us and said, hey, we don't have a digital leather cutter. Could we see what your guys' is like? And and in a year like COVID, depression's probably yeah. the biggest deal it's ever been, at least yeah. in my lifetime. Um, so if these people can get out and be active, I mean, we're all stuck at home, right? Right. And so when when it's sunny and you can go get some fresh air, but oh wait, I can't walk. I don't have proper shoes. Man. So to get these people, it's really about um what what's the goal? It's getting them to live the life that that they desire, yeah. whatever that might be. Um, and that that's a big deal. I don't yeah. know if I answered. No, that's that that's question. a huge deal because I I just want the listeners at home to know because I think some people that might be listening might have a family member or then themselves that might be dealing with the with these illnesses. And I think you kind of touched on it in the beginning. You know, it's sometimes these shoes aren't the prettiest, right? Those those shoes. And so having this option for them uh, is really nice. Now let's, let's get back to the business piece. You know, you're, you're the VP, right? You're kind of running query at this point. Um, have you, have you ran into any barriers as a female executive? You know, have you felt any barriers or, or, um, any resistance in the, in your industry, uh, being, cause you, as you mentioned earlier, you're kind of one of few in your industry. Yeah. Um, I would say one of the biggest challenges is figuring out honestly, as we grow, cause that's, I mean, I want growth, right. Right. right is sometimes in hiring. Mm, um, so as my dad moves further and further into retirement, I need another key man in a, in a role position. And, and I don't mean to say key man, but right, in right. this industry, um, to find, um, people that actually know how to make shoes is few and far between. Yeah. Um, and then you get into the position of, do I have that respect from them? Mm. Or if I'm being firm about what I want, all of a sudden I'm mm, yeah. a, a word I'm not going yeah, to say. We get you. Um, but if a, if a, if a, if a man said or acted the way that I, that I might be, um, he wouldn't get that same yeah, response. Just being a hard ass. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, I don't appreciate that. I've definitely had conversations, um, to some of my, you know, people that I've worked with or whether it's my father or, you know, I reach out to my brother is actually one of my brothers is 12 years older than me and been in the industry for a long time. So I reach out to him as a resource Mm -hmm. to say, Hey, this is what's happening. Do you think that that this is right? Mm -hmm. Is this what I should expect? Um, cause I really don't appreciate, you know, I'm a, I'm a strong woman, but I also don't run over people. Yeah. Um, I'm kind, um, but I do have a certain expectation. And so if you, if you get, you know, a certain way with people, it's just looked at totally differently than a, than a male. I would say in the industry, as far as with other physicians, um, I think I've, I've earned a pretty good sort of high regard with those that I've met. Um, I can't say that I necessarily would get that right off the bat. Um, you know, if I was to go in and, and try to market, you know, Crary or who we are, um, I, I'm sure I get a different response being a woman than, than if I was a man. Um, I do my best to mostly ignore it yeah. and just um, show who I am and, and our product and our service. And then, once they get to know me, then, then it kind of, it gets past that. Yeah. Um, I have to say, I haven't felt what it would be like in a corporate world trying to make my way mm. up. Um, I, I can imagine what it might be like, but I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So, so looking back on everything, you know, looking, what advice would you give a younger Meredith or even younger individuals that are thinking about going this route in, into entrepreneurship or uh, your profession? Um, you know, if it's something that you love to do, first of all, you want to make sure that that you love doing it. The job isn't fun every single day, but if you're passionate about what you're doing, 
um, than stay the course and be focused. There's times where I would say I focused, put my head down in my little bubble and focused more on minutia mm. versus going after that bigger piece or thinking, well, we're too small. We're always just going to be a small family business. And instead of opening my eyes to what it really could be, um, you know, now being more, also once say old, more mature, <laughs> um, and having some more experience and being in the industry for longer, um, you know, I definitely have more confidence, but, um, and then trying to stay within, okay, what does your company really represent and trying to make sure that everything I do is in pursuit of that mm, and yeah. not getting sidetracked. Yeah. Um, because that can really, can really waylay what you're trying to do. Um, you know, it doesn't happen overnight, yeah. but if you let yourself get too sidetracked, then it's going to take that much longer. Yeah. So, so what is Meredith's vision for Query? Where do, where do you see us in the next, you know, 10, 15, 20 years? Um, well, the last, honestly, several years, and I, I try to write down my goals. Oh, I love it. I love is, it. Is, um, for us to be, well, I think we are the best orthopedic footwear provider in the country, mm. but I want to have everybody in the country have access to us. Our biggest barrier is just access. Um, and I think with technology, um, we're going to be able to continue yeah. to do more. Um, we haven't done, you know, I get, I get whether it's other Pedorthus or orthotis companies like orthopedic companies reaching out to us saying, Hey, we can't get anybody to make us a decent custom shoe for our patients. The problem is, is they want us to make this awesome shoe and then they want to charge a double mm. and the margins aren't there when we're making shoes in this country. And so that's been a big barrier. We tested it a number of years ago and it's like, why am I going to work myself to the ground to make, yeah. A quarter. Yeah. Um, and so it's that, but, but I don't want to give up on that. Um, honestly, COVID has opened my eyes a little bit cause it's, you, it puts you in this state of not being able to reach people. Mm. So then it forces you to try to solve that problem versus like, meh, I'll deal with that later. Gotcha. So, I mean, example one is, um, a 95 year old man in a care facility um, or retirement home in South Dakota. Mm. He found us online. That's awesome. Who knew, right? Yeah. Um, and so we are, we had a virtual assessment. Oh, so wow. now yeah. my office is setting up, Hey, if you're going to even think about flying out, which for a lot of people isn't an option or whatever it is, um, let's do a virtual consult. I can look at people's feet through FaceTime or zoom or whatever it might be. Um, and I can make suggestions. I can see their footwear. I mean, everything short of being able to actually touch their feet. I can do a pretty good evaluation. Um, now we're working through how do we create, whether it's through a video or a PDF guide of how can we make a dummy proof guide to casting and measuring. Mm. So we're actually right now working on that. Um, I do have a, a, a basic video. Um, my brother's a videographer. So he's helped us with that. Um, and so I sent a whole casting kit. His son cast him, sent it back. I just yesterday 3D printed his last. Wow. And we will be mailing him shoes and then we'll follow up with a virtual delivery. And so he never speak. had to come here. He never came here. He never had to leave his room because he's obviously yeah. at the age that's a super high risk population. Yeah. Um, his nurse actually as a bonus was in on this video consult. That's not going to be the case for everybody. Right, right. But technology is, I can see it, yeah. right? It's right there. And we're able to, I think pretty soon our iPhones will be scanning the feet Yeah, and we're going to be able to make people shoes and ship them all over the country. That's amazing. So last question. Looking back on it all, would you do it all again? Absolutely. I might do a few things differently <laughs> um, to get to where I want to be and get there sooner. Of course, we all would. But um, but I love it. Um, and it just motivates me to continue to do better. I will never stop pushing 
to do a better job. I love it. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.